Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Um, yeah, apparently the Supreme Court was not willing to bail out the President of the United States. And as I wrote in my newsletter this morning, bear with me. But maybe it's just possible, just remotely possible, that Donald Trump doesn't really understand how the Supreme Court works. It's also possible that he doesn't really grasp what it means to be a conservative judge. And he has really no clue what things like judicial restraint actually mean. So yesterday he got uh, slapped down uh, in uh, in the Supreme Court. One sentence. The, the court didn't even bother to give an opinion. One sentence throwing out that challenge to Pennsylvania. This was the court case that was essentially asking, not essentially, asking the court to throw out hundreds of thousands of mail-in ballots or simply award the electoral votes to Donald Trump. Amazingly, the justices did not want to get involved in that particular uh, anti-democratic clusterfuck. So joining us today is our good friend Mike Murphy, who is, of of course, an enraged uh, former GOP strategist and advisor to uh, Republican voters against Trump and the co-host of Hacks on Tap podcast. So welcome back, Mike. It is good to be here, Charlie. I can vent some more rage, although my rage is a little bit ameliorated now that the country is clearly said with record numbers, you're fired, Donald. But still, I'm still cranky. Uh, there's a lot of things to be cranky about, including I, I, I see that, you, that uh, you folks over at the Hacks on Tap are calling it the kook d'etat. <laughs> the attempted kook d'etat. Well, no shortage of kooks, and they definitely have a little d'etat upon their minds. All right, but, let's uh, let, let's talk about this. Let's start off since we're we're starting off with kooks. Um, I was amazed to find out that televangelist Jim Baker was still alive. Yeah, me too. I, 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 about really miracles. Did, yeah. I did not know he was still alive, but he's out there and he's warning about the stakes of this election. And he's, he's not only all in for Donald Trump, he's suggesting that if Donald Trump is not kept in power, it will usher in the era of the Antichrist. Now, this may be a little bit painful, but sure. here is Jim Baker, the you know man of God, man of cloth, explaining the stakes here. This is where we are. This is what, what comes after this election. This is what God spoke to my heart, that if we do not re-elect uh, the President Trump, a, a man who take, took a stand, you know, against abortion. Mm -hmm. He took a stand ag against Antichrist stuff and all the things that were going on. Mm -hmm. We are in the time. The judgment of God has is beginning at the, as, as he takes, can I say, his throne? Because he's taking a throne to take over America. And it is a serious, serious time. Great. This is <laughs> you know, when a, when a send me your credit card, holy man, uh, starts talking about the uh, uh, liturgical term Antichrist stuff, <laughs> I don't know he's really, really worked up about this. I think uh, Trump's actually tried to bring down the Antichrist from the inside. That's been his plan all along reach sainthood yeah well it drag town you know it's always that way in trump world you scrape so, the bottom of the barrel you find some of these folks well they, and it's, they do that on a regular basis so the latest hail marys the texas attorney general who's apparently under indictment right i mean he's he's a crook paxton yeah. uh he's filed this cartoonish attempt to get the court to overturn the elections in four other states georgia michigan pennsylvania and wisconsin I and mean, this is amazing stuff that that they're, they're really at the point now where they're not even pretending what they're doing. They, they know that the courts really aren't going to um, aren't, aren't going to save them. So what do they what do we what do we have? We have the president who's actually tweeting out overturn. Did you hear the president's tweet this morning? We will uh, soon be learning about the word courage and saving our country. I received hundreds of thousands of legal votes more in all of the swing states than did my opponent. All data after the vote says it was impossible for me to lose unless fixed. So. OK, so first it was the courts. We we're going to look at this, the crack at evidence. And that didn't happen. Then he said the legislatures would step in and overturn. And that didn't happen. Now he's calling for courage. I mean, OK. Demented, deranged, even by Trump standards. What what is what is he now? What what does Donald Trump want to happen now? You know, I I look at this thing from kind of two angles, one of which boiling with rage, the other just exhausted. The, the exhausted angle is 
here's Trump trying to deal in his fragile psychological state with the fact that the country said, you're fired. They don't want him. Get out of here. We hate you. Um, he hasn't heard that since his dad. And so he's got a real crack in his psyche. So he's creating this alternate universe where he's the hero. He was ripped off. But, you know, deep down, he knows he lost. That, that, that's kind of the exhausting part. The furious part is it's kind of like when you're on a lot of highways now, as you drive down on, on the on the right side, they kind of make serrations in the asphalt or concrete. So if you drift over, you get that thump a thump a thump a thing. <laughs> well, he's been in the regular Trump highway of incredibly irresponsible, corrosive statements that, <clears throat> you know, frankly, are, are, are borderline treasonous. He's attacking our democracy. It's horrible. But now we can he's going into the thump a thump a as he veers into engaging in things that, you know, it, it, the rhetoric has to go one more click, but asking people to take action, which is really seditious. You know, it's one thing to have a bunch of phony lawsuits with Rudy Giuliani literally melting. Um, and it's another thing to start saying, take to the streets or wh wherever he's hinting he may be going. So we're kind of on the thump a thump a thump a thing. If we go any farther, it's, it's more than just Trump crazy. Now, now it's, it's, active work to undermine a democratic election in our democracy. And that calls for a whole new level. I mean, I think we're venturing into clear 25th Amendment territory. I would bet that a lot of that cabinet, knowing the jig is up and thinking about those board seats they'd love to get on, you know, a corporate board or two, might be really thinking about it. The problem is you need Pence, who's already plotting his 2024 presidential campaign, to take part. And I, I don't know if he'd do it, but, but we're, we're veering into yeah. troublesome territory now. It's, it's, it's sort of like, it, can we run out the clock? We have 42 days right, to go. Right. Will, will something really, really crazy happen? Uh, before we get too deep in this, I want to play the soundbite from yesterday, where again, he's also, you know, talking about courage and appeared to be, this was before the Supreme Court slapped him down with the uh, one sentence denial, uh, where he specifically seems to be challenging the legislatures and specifically the justices of the court uh, to do something bizarre um, that, that you know, so, so much for uh, judicial restraint and not legislating from the bench. It, I, I think it's telling that he uses the word uh, courageous here. But this is what he had to say yesterday. I received almost 75 million votes, the highest number of votes in the history of our country for a sitting president. Man. 12 million more than the 63 million we received mm. four years ago. President Obama received three million less in his second term, and he won easily. I received 12 million more, which, by the way, is a record, 12 million more. And they say that when the numbers came out and the numbers came through machines and all of those ballots were taken away and added, all you have to do is turn on your local television set and you'll see what happened with thousands of ballots coming out from under tables, with all of the terrible things you saw. All you have to do is take a look and... If somebody has the courage, I know who the next administration will be. And I'll tell you what, life will be much easier for this country because of what we've done right now. And because of a lot of the people in this room, the job you've done on the vaccine, together with a lot of others, has been a modern day miracle. And it's really been acknowledged as such. And I want to thank you. I want to give you my love. And I want to give you my thanks because you're very special people. And now, good luck. You distribute that general okay. and really set records. OK, set records just like we've been doing for four years. Thank you very much. So this was, this was an event about vaccines, understand vaccines. And he goes off on on his rant about how he couldn't have possibly lost because of, of his math. And he's convinced <laughs> himself, I got more votes than before. So therefore, I couldn't have, you know, I couldn't lose. Look, yeah. I, look, I don't know. I mean, they there got to be charlatans like like Ted Cruz, who know this is all bullshit, who know this is lying. But they're doing it because they want to you know, advance themselves politically because there's cash to be raised or there's clicks to be won or whatever. Um, but, that, you know, there are a lot of folks out there that don't know that this is just complete and utter bullshit. No, look, he's the president of the United States. I mean. You know, it's like when Clinton lied to the country about his private life. It's not, of course, equivalent in scale, but it's the same thing. You put the the honor and the respect of the office you hold behind your narrow, selfish lies. And that's what he's doing. And it's incredibly it. Look, it is it is an attack on our democratic institutions because democracy works on a shared set of beliefs that, you know, we're playing a fair game here. And we are we are. I'm in the election business for 30 years. I know something about election fraud and we don't have very much of it in the U.S. We have tiny we have more of an error factor 
in elections than we have absolute fraud. So he is in a a fantasy land, and it just shows this psycho narcissism. That's all about him and his his, yeah. his fragile everything. Um, but the the collateral damage here, because yeah, with thirty forty million people are going to believe the election was stolen, and that is. I mean, back in the common turn days, and you can even argue last week, the Soviets or the Russians or any of our enemies would have loved this. They, they beyond their wildest dreams because the American democracy is being actively hurt by a, a madman president of the United States. So we got to roll them up in a carpet and get them out of there. But, you know, he, he it was funny. He went quiet for a while and yeah. then the sulking period went on. And now now we're on the vengeful lunatic period. And he's well, doing and, and, he, and he thinks it's working. I mean, he, he obviously oh, yeah. thinks it's working. The polls would suggest that that he's got the Republican base ginned up. Um, there's an interesting piece in The New York Times this morning. Even in defeat, Trump tightens grip on state GOP lawmakers. In Pennsylvania, the president's false claims of a rigged vote may inflame the party base for years to come. And they quote one lawmaker who said that if you refuse to back up his assertions, that she would get her house bombed. Uh, oh, look, uh, yeah, it's the mob, you know, um, the, the in terms of the, the popular terrorists. mob, the Committee on Public Safety here with leader Trump. I will say this. I I may be being a little optimistic, but I, I, I see a couple of green shoots. As Trump is uh, uh, scrubbed out of office over time, and that will happen, um, it's been interesting to me that, you know, he started attacking on multiple times, mostly by Twitter in person in Georgia, Governor Kemp of Georgia and Governor right. Ducey of Arizona for not like, you know, heel clicking and, and, and stealing an election form. Um, they're still here. You know, the, the Trump attack tweet that destroys your political career. Yeah, maybe not so much now. So I, I think I do think Trump's power in the party will will not go away, but I think it does have a bit of a half life, and yeah. we're moving past peak Trumpism now. And and so in a year from a year from now, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that he'll have the same grip as before. I tend to believe he won't. Well, I hope you're right. See, and this is what get, makes it complicated. Um, Aaron Blake in the Washington Post has an interesting point, saying, you know, it's worth emphasizing that the vast majority of Republicans who've actually had to decide, who have legal skin in the game have actually gone against Donald Trump, like the officials in Georgia, in Arizona, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, the ones who have to make the actual decision as opposed to tweet or sign a letter or anything, uh, they they have not backed up Trump's com uh, complaints. However, and I want to get your take on this, this Texas lawsuit is just, it's going absolutely nowhere. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get yeah, dropped yeah, kick yeah. as fast as the Pennsylvania one. But it is interesting, the number of Republicans that have rushed forward to support it. This is a lawsuit that explicitly Willie wants to disenfranchise millions of votes, nullify the votes in my home state of Wisconsin, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And the two Republican senators from Georgia who are on the ballot in a few weeks, Kelly Leffler and David Perdue, endorsed the lawsuit. They sided with Texas over their own state. Can you explain yeah. that to me? Well, I, I can. It's it's grim business. It is it is kabuki theater. It's optics. I mean, as you say, the Republicans who have to sign something with power to legally do something awful have declined. The Republicans who endorse foolish things like lawsuit, like I saw Kelly Leffler, who was such an embarrassment, and I, I've, I'm in Twitter trouble because I explain why I might actually vote for her and then go be sick, and I'll explain that. But uh, she's so awful, and I watched that terrible debate. And she was, um, you know, answered the was Georgia stolen or not question by, well, the, I'm for investigations. You know, now I'm for lawsuits. The president has a right to a lawsuit. That's kind of the bullshit line they're using yeah. now. And it, it doesn't have any teeth, but it gives them a shield for Trump's crazies. And of course, because somehow uh, the modern elected official in the Republican Party equates losing a primary with dying in the sands of Omaha Beach as equal tragedies, they have scurried into this this rhetoric. Maybe ten percent are crazy enough to believe it, or fifteen, but most know they're putting on a puppet show uh, for voters. I'm sure they privately hold in contempt, and uh, it's it's horrible. And they're you know the, it's funny the Republicans have a fetish, particularly at the grassroots, about using the term patriots, but we're extremely short of patriots right now in the Republican Party. Well, that is the problem, you know, that that but you would expect that it's that th at this point. And then, look, I know I'm repeating myself because I, I keep coming back to this. This is an easy moment to be a patriot. 
it is an easy moment to put country over party. It, yep. it is, it is. And, and after four or five years of complete disillusionment and soul crushing disappointment with so many Republicans, I still find myself um, disappointed and disillusioned by the number of Republicans that are, that are either hiding in the tall grass when the president is undermining the democracy or who are actively out there going, well, there, you know, there, there's real evidence here. I have to tell you, right before we started this, I'm reading an article by a guy in the conserv- in the right wing media here in Wisconsin who I've known for years and years and years. Smart guy. I'd actually lobbied for him to get a job at one point, hardworking, and he's gone completely batshit crazy. Not yeah. only supporting all the conspiracy theories about the election in Wisconsin, and there was nothing wrong with the election in Wisconsin. We've had a recount. There's no evidence. Joe Biden won this. It's decisive. It's not really in question. He's not only defending that, he's attacking the Supreme Court justice, the conservative justice who said, yeah, we're not taking a case that is going to throw out the election, that's going to throw away the votes of millions of Wisconsinites and just turn the electoral college votes over to Donald Trump. And so this guy is not only defending the batshit crazy conspiracy theories, he's attacking the judge who did the right thing. And I'm going, how did this happen? I mean, is there did somebody put these red pills in everybody's <laughs> coffee a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, I, I look, I'm with you, Charlie. In many ways, the last week has been the worst. Yeah. Because the the country voted, the Trump question was settled fairly and accurately, and now people, you know, we all join the cause for a reason. Uh, Thirty years ago, you know, we're going to fight the Soviets. Freedom is good. Free enterprise. And I thought all the people that I was in the trenches with so long traveling around the country electing republicans we're, we all we all joined the cause we you know we it was there was purpose to it all and we were the good guys and now you look at it and and you see after the election they're all folding like chairs to this fantasy which again is 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 injecting a cancer into our democracy and the gutlessness of it now you know, I'm hoping this is the kind of final death spasm of it. But, boy, it's been mm. heartbreaking this last week. Yeah, uh, I, I expected we, we, better. I, 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 I did, too. And see, this is part of the problem. We we have been expecting, well, that will be the death spasm of this. You know, people will see this and they won't go any further. Or you'd hope that Donald Trump's defeat would mean that they would move on. But it hasn't. OK, so, hey, I got to back up a little bit. Did I hear you say you might actually vote for Kelly Leffler? Well, here I tweeted I'd had a drink or two. And of course, the left wing Twitter spear went crazy. I was watching this horrible debate. It was. Bad. And I said, my, my problem and I wrote a piece about this in the bulwark some months back. Mm-hmm is like many never Trumpers, I'm in the tortured debate between should we hold the Senate or should we not, we Republicans, because I I haven't left the party. I'm staying to fight to the end Hmm. on this. And so I I eventually came to kind of the weak argument that a Senate where McConnell has a one vote advantage might incentivize, might give Biden some cover to stay in the center and might incentivize the ours who aren't running for president. So, you know, you can take out 10 senators um, uh, to actually do a few things because it would be in their political interest and they'd, they'd have some political real politic forcing them to. So out of that equation, I thought, all right, I probably want one of these two chuckleheads to win down there in Georgia. But, and you know, ideologically, I'm not with Ralph Warnock, although I think he is the superior mm person in many ways to Leffler. So I tweeted, um, if I if I thought Purdue was going to lose, I'd, uh, I'd probably have to vote for Kelly Leffler and then go vomit and wish I was writing in Paul Coverdale, my old client, by the way, I worked the last <laughs> Georgia runoff. So of course, Twitter exploded. But I, I, I'm torn between vengeance on the gutless Republicans in the Senate and ideological need for balance. And I've been tilting for the one vote Senate, but I'm not, a, you know, it's it's a tough call. They're so no, it, bad. It, 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 it is a tough call. And, and I certainly would like to have ideological balance. But I got to tell you, I'm all in now, right now on, on vengeance. I mean, uh, I don't, salt, I don't blame salt the I'm earth, Irish. burn them down vengeance. <laughs> because this this horrible moment that we're in right now, where you see the, the president who is undermining democracy, attacking democracy, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, is only possible because of these down ballot Republicans. You know, it is. The the mediocrity of the elected Republican um, Congress is just stunning. I, and, I, and look, I I'm a I, I love David French. I'm a, I'm I'm a Frenchist, but you know he made the case, don't burn it all down. Well, you know, two years ago, you know, part of his don't burn it all down philosophy was that we needed to vote for honorable Republicans. Like, well, are you ready for this, Marsha Blackburn? <laughs> yeah. a, a, a Senate with Marsha Blackburn and Kelly Leffler and Tommy Tuberville and 
Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz. I'm I'm sorry, you know, Donald Trump is awful, but you know, Trumpism is embodied in that, you know, in in that group as as well. And 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 that's as toxic and is as dangerous going forward. And the way that they are propping him up I and know. urging him on and enabling him right now at his very worst tells me they cannot be trusted with power or trust in any way. So screw them all. Oh, believe me, I resonate to that <laughs> argument. I am I am so torn. I mean, I want the old Tin Men Home Improvement Commission with the ceiling fans and the difficult questions because there's such – one, there are no shortage of chuckleheads, although I can say that about the deeds too. But the moral – weakness and cowardice of this group has, has stunned me. Um, and look, I, I, one of my best friends in the Senate, I, I worked for him the first time he ran for president and I loved it. I was so impressed by the guy and I helped him in his Senate come back is Lamar Alexander. And yeah. I know, I know who he is. It stunned me. It stunned me. The reform governor of George, uh, excuse me, Tennessee, who fought corruption at some risk. Hell, he, he led a drive for segregation as editor of the student newspaper at Vanderbilt. And for Lamar to go into the, the tall grass just, just broke my heart. So When he's got um, nothing to lose. When oh, he I has know, literally nothing to lose. I know. It, 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 is, uh, it was some calculation, I think, involving the primary to replace him. But again, it's unforgivable uh, as somebody with such a great career in public life would do that. So, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I have vengeance on my mind, too. But then again, I got into this business because I think the left hurts the people it tries to help. And so I'm, I'm, I, my last tweet is, you know, the firestorm of people named, you know, Biden lover Trotsky rocks or whatever uh, on Twitter was, look, I'm glad I don't vote there. And so if the, I thought Purdue, who's a jerk, by the way, I never liked this stuff that you say about uh, 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 Romney, uh, I, I would take him over her because she's so hopelessly mediocre and pliable. But um, again, I'm glad I don't vote there. So I know that there's a I'm, I'm looking around my my office where I have way too many books from the Trump era. I actually was telling my <laughs> wife, we had to do something with all these. And, and there's a theme in many of them, which is, you know, Trump is killing the Republican Party or this is the death of the Republican Party. And you know, I wrote how the right lost its mind. It does occur to me today that all of this insanity and deception actually doesn't kill the Republican Party because it's working. So Newsmax actually beat Fox News in one hour. I mean, I'm not defending Fox News, but Newsmax is out there. They have no qualms about spreading the misinformation and the fantasies and the conspiracy theories. And it's working for them. They actually won one hour oh, last yeah. week. And Donald Trump, who every day is just a fire hose of lies and bullshit, is looking at the polls and going, hey, I got 70 percent of Republicans who think that um, – who are believing my lies, that I didn't actually lose the election, that I clearly, decisively, and obviously lost. I, yeah, can, Newsmax, I, can, I can keep doing this. This is going to be an interesting war. Newsmax makes Fox look like uh, the Roman Senate. I know. It, it's uh, it's completely lunatic. I feel sorry for Greg Kelly, who I, I, I know in real life is, is a seemed like a reasonable, decent person. And I watch him do his act on TV. It just breaks my heart. Um yeah. So, but there's going to be a war because Newsmax and OAN are better at what we TV geeks call the uh, over the top or the basically non-traditional cable channel way to distribute streaming content. And they're doing well there. So Fox is going to have an attack from the right. And it's going to be interesting to see how all the cable networks deal with a Biden administration. Easiest for the, the Fox and the OANs and the Newsmax is just to be pure asset throwers. But, you know, there's going to be competition in their market. So, no, I get your I get your point. And it did work down ballot. Now, I think part of the reason it worked down ballot was not Trump driven. It was Democratic Party driven because and, and this is impolitic to say these days, but the Democrats are so obsessed with identity politics. I mean, I even, and I voted for Biden. I sent him money. I'm glad he won, but I, I took and froze the front page of his website because it was very telling. It's a good book about all this called The Once and Future Liberal by Mark Lilla okay. um, about how they're, it's an attack on identity politics from the left. Anyway, if you look, if you went down the website, there's a little cartoon icon of all the different, and every voter is a type. There are like 20 types there. And there, there's no unifying shining city on a hill or even make America great again idea. It's all my group versus your group. All we groups get together because we all have grievances to share. And so when the, the Democrats are always talking about groupism, 
they let the Trumps of the world convince white people they're a group under attack with grievances and they got to huddle together. And Mm. statistically, they're the largest group. So when the Dems let themselves on the congressional level be defined as just, you know, we're going to help Biden and we're not really going to defund the police, though some of us think that's a pretty good idea. Uh, it just sends all the all the identity messages to hunker down, split your ticket, and not trust them. So, part of the fuel for Republican success is clearly coming from the the kind of loud progressive and even AOC squad wackadoodle wing of the Democratic Party, uh, and they got to get that under control, or they can lose the House. There's no doubt the Republicans are in the hunt. And that, I mean, this is a nightmare scenario, I think, for both of us. There will be loud Trumpy stuff around it. So the media and the argument will have some power. will say, wow, Trumpism is back. The Republicans right. just won the House with those messages. And that increasingly will put the Republican Party on a path to both moral embarrassment and long-term political decline. But so short-term, see- there's something to do there, and that worries me. Are, are, are you are you worried about the way the identity politics is playing out in the selection of the cabinet and the the administration of, uh, of Joe Biden? You know, a little bit. I mean, I think they're a little heavy on optics. So net, I give Biden like an A minus. Now, of course, he had the, any hack on tack listener will will know as as David Axrod, my podcasting partner, has had to listen to a thousand times. It's an insult to the country. He didn't put Gina Raimondo into a big job, the governor mm-hmm. of Rhode Island, who is easily the best Democratic governor in That's America. Great. But the public employee unions don't like her because she can do math. Um, But I I think basically he has he has tilted center Dem just like he did in the campaign, which is a good thing. Now, will Bernie Sanders wind up as labor secretary? Boy, oh, boy, that'll be a fun day in American business. Uh, And it could happen. Um, He you know, the kerfuffles now are first, you know, General Austin, who by all accounts is outstanding and would do a good job. But Michelle Flournoy has a lot of friends in the kind of D.C. foreign policy establishment are very excited about her getting the job. She was she was impressive, too. I don't really buy this military thing, although I I worked as a civilian uh, consultant for the secretary of defense uh, years ago. And there is tremendous budget and rivalry between the services. You know, you talk to. Uh, the Air Force, they explain we don't need aircraft carriers. You talk to the Navy and they compliment the Air Force for their ability to fly spare parts out to mm-hmm. Navy aircraft carriers. They're like FedEx to them and et cetera, et cetera. So having an Army general in that internal thing could be a little disruptive, but I'm, I'm not too worried about him. The other one is Neera Tandon, uh, who the Republicans OMB. are all excited about for OMB, a very powerful job. And uh, my advice to the Republicans has been contrarian, which is, look, I know she tweeted horrible things about you as a partisan Dem, which she is, a fierce partisan. But uh, we're not the party of, of thin skin about horrible tweets, at least with any moral high ground for a while. And two, if you kill her, you'll probably get somebody more progressive. She is a centrist like Biden, and you want that on the wallet, the OMB, the money. So, you know, put on your big boy pants and get over a few tweets and take the best ideological win you're going to get in a Democratic administration with Nira, who can do two plus two is four. So, but anyway, apparently, and the left doesn't like her either, which credentials her to me, but I think the Repubs are making a mistake with her. Well, yeah, no, it's also interesting to have Republicans who spent the last four years not reading any of Donald Trump's tweets now suddenly deciding that, uh, that, every, <laughs> that every one of their attendance tweets over the last 10 years becomes disqualifying. And also that that being nasty on Twitter is is a big deal. It's, it's Oh, it's a, horrible. Uh, yeah. And big on, problem on General Austin. I, he's obviously a great American and, and a great general. But I have I do have to say, though, the, the flip flop, the Democrats are in the middle of we'll, we'll have to exercise. Will have to uh, execute is the word I want the the, the flip flop they will have to execute on uh, allowing him to be the uh, you know passing a waiver so that you could have a general as Secretary of Defense is is one of those things that makes me wince because after all yeah, these years saying we we yeah, very cynical I mean you know that we that we have all of these norms and we're going to restore the norms um, and you had seventeen members of the Senate who voted against granting a waiver for General Mattis now in retrospect I think it was a good thing that they passed a waiver to allow General Mattis to be the Secretary of Defense because Donald Trump desperately needed someone like him in his cabinet. But that's a that's not like a once in a generation, once in a in a century type thing, because the principle of civilian control of the Department of Defense is, is not just an abstraction. I think you pointed out the practical difficulties of it. But, you know, the skill set of, of a general 
is really not the same as the skill set of the Secretary of Defense. And there's a reason why when Congress created the Department of Defense, they specifically said that it's it's got to be led by a civilian. And they really went out of their way to make right. sure. Right. Oh, it was always. That, right, right. You need, yeah. you bend the rules for a general marshal. And, you know, we did for Jim Mattis, but you're sure. right about the hypocrisy. The other thing is what the Pentagon really needs is massive reform. You know, the Pentagon is an impressive machine. You feed a dollar in, you get about 62 cents worth of value out the other end. And it, it it's still very, there's a lot, there's change going on, but the center of gravity is still waiting for a Soviet tank attack on the North German plane. You know, it's very hard to get generals to look forward. And we, we have a, a, a bunch of young, outstanding officers who think that way, but the that they really need a powerhouse sec def with a president behind them to do the politics of some reorganization. And, you know, in my experience there, anybody over, over three stars is a politician, but you really need a super politician. So I, I take your point and I think it was a bit of a stumble. The other thing I thought he'd do um, was a big crafty old school cigar chomping politician move which is call up Mitch Daniels, who has split his mm-hmm. career between effective budget politics in Washington, effective, very effective governor of Indiana, and effective pharmaceutical executive, and said, Mitch, can I get you to come in for two years and fix HHS and be my Republican there? Because, you know, there's not a lot of difference between a Republican or Democratic case of COVID-19. Um, I think Mitch is the kind of guy who might have done it, and he could have checked his Republican box with a with a governing conservative there. Instead, we have Becerra, the AG here in California, a former congressman, fairly effective operator on the Hill, but a bit of a liberal hack, to be honest. So I was a little disappointed with that and, choice. And kind of a culture warrior, right? I mean, yeah. Yep. He's, I mean, I'm reading from cultural conservatives. This seems to be the real flashpoint for them, that here's a guy that actually sued the Little Sisters of the Poor to make them cover pills that caused abortions or something. I, I look, I, I'm not really that familiar with him, but this seems to have been the, the one not is not regarded as center left by cultural conservatives. It's regarded as yeah. really out there. Yeah, I thought that. And finally, they're wasting Pete Buttigieg. You know, yeah, they're talking about ambassador to China. He'd be very effective, but he's a world class talent. They ought to give him commerce. Or I, uh, I told a friend of his he ought to take White House communications director and be on TV every day. I mean, he is. Wouldn't he be great? He is really good, and they ought to harness him up uh, in one of these big jobs. And, and instead, you know, they they're so I don't know. I give him. I guess I'm going to move him down to a B plus. The more I think about Becerra. Okay, let's talk um, about Pete. Yeah, yeah. but Becerra. But ideologically, it could be worse. I guess I'd say. Well, could always be worse. So, but Pete Buttigieg, I agree with you that that you kind of want him to be around. But you know, I was thinking about that. Um, maybe you know, sending him out as ambassador to China gives him some of the seasoning, some of the gravitas that he might lack. So, in a way, grooming him for much bigger positions. Because let's face it, okay. So you put him in as Secretary of the VA or Secretary of Commerce. These are kind of dead end jobs, um, and so kind of think of it as a boomerang. You send him out to China. Uh, bolster his credentials and bring him back as something much more significant later. No, I, this, guy, this guy is what he's, he's like, uh, you know, 22 years old. I mean, he's, he's going to be around for, for freaking average. He's going to be around for another 50 years. Yeah, no, no, it's true. And I you mean, know, it's, it's like the old true. George HW Bush ambassador to UN and look, he'll right, do great right, in China. Right. He'll come back, but he'll probably speak Chinese by then. He's the kind of bright guy who'll do the immersion and learn the 900 words. Um, but the down, I would say putting on a Pete Buttigieg fan hat, other than our obvious ideological differences. The one problem is you go to the PRC and now you own the PRC and you're working for Tony Blinken, who's going to micromanage the big stuff. Um, you'll be a voice at the table, but very few U.S. ambassadors in an A-list country in the last 30 years have had much to do with making policy. So you get all the downside. You, you don't. You're, you're not. You're not given the order. So it, 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 I think it's a mixed bag. But but on the other hand, you're right. He'll be able to come back, and well, his his arsenal of impressive card tricks will increase, and he'll do a great job. I just. Um, I guess I was thinking of that George H. W. Bush model of of using right. it. So Tony Blinken, um, obviously a safe choice for Secretary of State, solid guy, experience, close to the president. Um, I have no, I, n- nothing negative to say about that at all. I am fascinated though by this dynamic between John Kerry being, you know, in the cabinet and having this being in every single meeting and being on the National Security Council. Is is that going to be complicated? 
T- Tony Blinken and and then like right next to you, the former secretary of state, you know, John Kerry, who's kind of known as being uh, a freelancer. Yeah, I, I well, it, it has the potential to be complicated. I think Blinken has been Biden's staff for a long time, so they have the symbiotic relationship. And, you know, uh, if if Biden picked a secretary of state who had maybe a ton of gravitas but did not have a personal relationship with Biden, I doubt it would work because Biden's always been really more interested in foreign policy than anything else. So it's going to be something the POTUS is very interested in. So you kind of want a, a sex state is going to be totally aligned and can read right, his totally mind and be a proxy for him. But Kerry, they've given Kerry an interesting portfolio, you know, and I think he's got, again, I'm putting aside my ideological worries. I think he does have the personality, the gravitas and the temperament to go out and, and be the climate change guy interacting with the endless world appetite for discussion about climate change. So I don't know. I, I, I have a feeling, and I'm guessing here, that politicians like Kerry, who've had a good run, but are now in their, in their twilight, are more interested in kind of place in history, being effective, moving the needle, done. than they are like, how will this play in New Hampshire? I got to plot my next political move. So I'm, okay. I'm kind of guardedly optimistic about that. But I think the Blinken uh, Biden thing is such a, you know, mind meld that it'll probably work pretty smoothly. So I, I don't know how this is going to play out, but obviously if you're giving advice to the Biden, you know, folks about what, what do you prioritize? You got to get the economy right and you got to get the vaccination right. Those would be the two things. You don't get those right. Then nothing else works for you. The politics of the vaccine just fascinate me because Trump wants to take credit for it, right? He wants to say, I am the one that's responsible. It's the Trump vaccine. And so he's pushing it. And yet my gut tells me that after January 21st, much of Trump world is going to become anti-vaxxer. And so yeah, they won't be able to resist it like flies to the dung. Um, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you're Biden, I think you, you, it's pretty simple. It kind of, it, all of a sudden it's 19, uh, December 41. All right. We're, we're going to need a million tanks in a year called Detroit. Um, and so what, what can we do to get 200 million doses done and out there by the end of April and delivered? The good news is that the good old USA is still great at logistics and those, 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 uh, nasty, um, uh, Navy guys and admirals I used to work with, they're kind of right about the the military, particularly the Air Force. They're incredibly good at moving stuff. FedEx, UPS, all those logistical hubs, which are incredibly complex. A lot of ex-military guys were involved in building that. So I, I have, I think we're going to rise to the occasion on vaccine production and vaccine distribution. So, uh, but Biden's got to do that. He's got to get a stimulus bill through. And I'm I'm one of these fiscal conservatives fretting about this thing is costing World War II dollars and, and real dollars. But the sooner you inject some dough into the system, the less damage it'll do. Some of these small businesses aren't coming back. That can start to wreck commercial real estate, credit unions, you know. And so this thing is, it's like a spreading virus there in the economy and they got to pump out a good chunk they, they, of money. They, they, really ha- they really have to as well. And, and this is one of those moments where uh, though it, it is a K-shaped recovery where you do have different, you know, two Americas or three Americas here. And there's there's a you know, there are millions of Americans who are being told, stay home, don't go to work uh, because of the coronavirus. And yet if there's not money out there, they're just going to fall through any safety net that we have. Yeah, so no, it's going to be if, incredibly. If we're, if we're shutting down the businesses, we need to help them. Yeah. The other problem is in our modern technological era, the miracle, the reason we're not all in bread lines is if you work with your brain, you can do most of it from home on a a digital device connecting you to other people. If you work with your hands, you're out of luck. And we already have this income disparity. People who work with their hands have had flat real wages for a long time until only recently as that started to creep up. So if we, if we want our democracy to hold up, we got to we got to make it work for people who right now are being destroyed by the reality that they can't go on Zoom to run their carpentry shop. So we got to inject money there and fast. 
Well, what's interesting about this, is, though, is now we're going to have a test for the, this new populism. And I thought it's interesting that Josh Hawley, who uh, I'm, I'm to say that I'm not a fan, is putting it mildly, but so he's decided he <laughs> yeah, needs he's to the worst because he knows better. He's not dumb. Exactly. That's exactly why he's he's one. He's the worst of the worst. But he's out there going, you know, we're trying to blow up the compromise they have by saying we need to send out checks to everybody, you know, twelve hundred dollar checks. And, and apparently he's gotten Trump's ear. And now the White House is saying that. We need to send out six hundred dollar checks to everybody, and the and the way they're going to pay for it is by slashing the unemployment benefits. Now, wait, I, I I'm not posing for holy pictures here, but I don't need another check for six hundred dollars. I do not need a check for six hundred dollars. There are people out there, the kinds of people who are in these massive food lines and everything, whose jobs have disappeared. You know, if you're going to spend this kind of money, send it to the people who actually need it. Target it to the people who have exactly. lost their job. Don't send it to the people like me who are still sitting here on Zoom making a living. No, so, you're exactly so, right. You grab the W two. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's irrational. Yeah, totally, totally. And don't don't pay for it with a tax cut, please. Right. You know, again, it is. Um, the, the you know in the old days we'd have politics and then it would stop and become real politics in right. the sense of the word where people would wheel and deal and get stuff done. Now the kabuki never ends. We have the kabuki networks. We have the kabuki. I mean, Josh Holly right now is thinking about how fast can I start hiring people in New Hampshire. Uh, it's just a mono focus on on getting elected in a Republican primary. So, you know, folks like that right now are not a force for good in either party. So does Mitch McConnell want a deal or does he want to just shove it over and uh, in, into a Biden administration? What does he want? You know, what Mitch wants to do is win both races in uh, Georgia. That's, the right That's answer. probably <laughs> all he cares about between now and the 5th of January. But if he is convinced that, quote, getting something done will help that, he'll do it. If he's convinced that stoking Trump madness will help that, then he'll do that. He is, he's like an AI machine. You know, he's, he, they give him a task, the computer whirs, and an absolutely unsentimental decision is made. But, but after Georgia, um, I do think he'll be interested in infrastructure and some stuff like that, because he, he I think he, he wants to show a little governing power, but he'll have caucus politics because you're going to have people saying, Hey, you know, we, we shut him down. We, uh, we, we, we kill them, we, we make them a failure, then we'll win more seats in the midterms. And, you know, Republicans are defending twice as many as the Dems are in the Senate. The House guys are going to be the worst because they're going to be like full attack, win the House. You know, um, yeah. but I think McConnell, McConnell understands how to score. He's like the football coach who understands the running play and the passing play. And so I think he's capable of passing the ball when he thinks it'll win the game. And I think there's going to be a window where the country is going to want that, particularly as Trump is dragged out kicking and screaming and the, and the crazy reaches a fever pitch in January. But Biden's election is greeted with relief and hope. Uh, and do the Republicans really want to be the Grinch there? I think there's an opportunity for, for Mitch to help him, self, help the caucus, help the politics. And uh, the question is, will Biden soften on some of the labor Davis-Bacon stuff in a big infrastructure package so he can actually you know, yeah. get some value for dollars? But I don't know. I see room there. And, you know, it is true, by the way. There, there's one, one thing that I think the commentators have missed. For Mitch McConnell, one of the most important things happening is that his wife is leaving the Trump cabinet. <laughs> the glue you know, that I, binds, you know, that's not been a small factor because personally, I'm sure he detests Trump. Yeah, but and and that's been a real tie here. No, I I do think that there's the the mood in January is going to be I there's going to be still a lot of anger, but I think it's going to be relief, and then of course Mitch McConnell has to decide. Um, the Mitch McConnell has to decide whether or not, in order to sabotage an incoming Biden administration, he's willing to actually sabotage the economy, and um, I think that that's that's a tough one. It's one it was one thing to to uh, to cut uh, Barack Obama's tires to make him a one term president, but but you know when you're faced with the pandemic, when you're faced with this kind of an economic challenge, I'm not sure that he wants to be the, the Grinch at that moment. But who knows? There's a there's a story yeah. I wish I wish I had it in front of me from Obama's book, which is actually rather entertaining, um, where he describes a, a scene with Mitch McConnell where somebody stops McConnell and and trying to talk about the merits of a public policy issue, you know, why, why a certain piece of legislation is good. And um, McConnell just raises his hand, holds his hand up and says, you apparently are under the impression that I give a damn. 
<laughs> no, so no, he, he 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 missed his vocation in the 19th century as a riverboat gambler. You know, because that that calculator is 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 first, but it's, there's not a lot of sentimentality there. But I think Mitch is smart enough to understand that we're going to go into an era of hope post Trump. There's going to be a rotation, and I'm hoping the country is sparked a political hope by a TV pilot that I'm hopefully shooting for CBS in, in mm. January, starring Dr. McDreamy himself, the great Patrick Dempsey, who's a real political junkie himself. It it's set in the U.S. Congress among a bunch of cynical killer politicians on both sides, wow. and a, a little hope breaks out, and they find they like it. And really? so that uh, with a little luck, that'll be, if the pilot is picked up, that'll be coming to your TV screen in September of next year. I need something else to binge on, because you know I'm almost at the end of the West Wing. So. Oh yeah, well we're we're a little more cynical in West Wing, but you will see Congress in the real way, uh, which will be a lot of fun. And we're we're casting now. We're getting some tremendous actors, a big ensemble. So you know, no guarantee we're going on the air, but we're we're a pilot, and we're gonna we're gonna start shooting oh, late January, early February. And uh, you know, this could be it could be a very interesting year in American politics. Oh, it will be an interesting year. Mike Murphy, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, and for uh, re really uh, very grateful for how generous you are with your time today. Oh, thank you, pal. It was fun as always. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again.